So as we think about the future of computing, one of my roles and, and the co-authors of the paper is to look at where we think big radical transformations in computing will occur and what the implications of those are for all of us, not just for Microsoft, but for society, for the computing industry, for research at large. And so it will touch on everything from the implications of the Internet of Things, the explosive growth of intelligence embedded in everyday objects, to the implications of cloud services, because cloud data centers are the biggest computing systems we've ever built on this planet by a large measure. And I say that as a supercomputing guy, and so that's a big statement about scale and scope. Uh, and about how the interplay of those things will drive changes in really what I think is a big revolution that's coming in computing. Because almost everything that we think about in computing is predicated on a 40-year-old model of interaction, of windows, of mice, of pointers. And your computer, whether it's a smartphone or a PC, literally sits there unless you poke it. And so that transformation to implicit computing where sensors uh, and data analytics and natural interaction allow computers to become intelligent assistants to interact with us, anticipate our needs, and respond, whether it be helping us perform business tasks or as we think about the future of intelligent transportation systems and what it might mean for a future of hybrid and electric vehicles, what it means for smart grids and how we manage energy more efficiently, how we think about entertainment, how we think about providing information and social services. All of those things are going to be driven by this transformation in the way we think about computing with this combination of massive scale and number of devices on the one hand and massive scale and our ability to extract insights from data and personalize that. That's really the revolution, and that's what this article will talk about. One thing I like to say about computing is, having been a professor for years and now in the corporate world and, and looking at where technology is going, is it's important to remember that the questions don't change, but the answers do. And they change because the ratios of speeds and feeds, of capacities and performance, and the economics of those shift. And so we've seen this pendulum swing from centralized to distributed back multiple times over the history of computing. Interestingly, it's swinging in both directions because we have the massive proliferation of the Internet of Things and sensors and devices on the one hand, and we have this massive development of cloud infrastructure on the other hand. And I really do think both are important because the scale of, of cloud infrastructure brings the ability to do analysis at, at some levels that we haven't been able to do before. But if I look at, at say, silicon technology uh, as an example, uh, anyone who's predicted the end of silicon scaling has been wrong up to this point. Uh, I believe there's headroom, for sure, that we'll continue to see scaling. I think it's also important to remember, though, that no exponential is forever. The laws of physics uh, eventually drive some constraints, as do economics. And if one draws an analogy, for example, at commercial airplanes, uh, if you look back at the history of airspeed records from the Wright brothers up until the current day, uh, at some point uh, commercial aircraft stopped getting faster, not because it wasn't physically possible, but because the economics simply didn't work anymore. didn't mean that innovation stopped. Innovation just shifted to some different metrics of success. It wasn't just speed. It was things like glass cockpits, composite bodies, load management systems, all kinds of things continue to drive innovation. I think we'll continue to see that multivariate, multimetric kind of, of innovation happen. I think in silicon per se, there's an interesting thing happening, which as we move from continuing to increase clock speeds uh, to multicore as really a reaction to our inability to dissipate energy from chips, that there's another interesting dynamic happening, because the lesson there is you get ops per joule optimization by virtue of functional specialization. And I think that's going to drive a much more diverse ecosystem of the kinds of multicore chips and accelerators that one sees. A couple of interesting things to think about as we think about undergraduate computing education and curricula. One is really the explosive growth of parallel computing. And historically, parallel computing has been something that we think about in applications of computational science and high-performance computing. 
But the growth of multi-core processors and the fact that parallelism exists in GPUs and, and general purpose processors, but the growth of heterogeneity and parallelism even in embedded devices means that parallel computing is not something that you learn after the fact uh, as a special case, but in fact sequential computing becomes the special case of the norm. So how we think about embedding parallel computing in curricula is one fundamental issue. I think the other issue that we're struggling with, frankly, is that one of the things that we've done in computing curricula is we've treated it as an onion. Uh, every time new topics come up, we add another layer to the onion. We keep preserving all of the things that those of us who've been around for a while believe are important and want to hang on to. But fundamentally, we have to make some choices about what we teach, and I think that's going to lead to multi more and more multi-track curricula. But I think the other issue that's really important as we think about computing, whether you're a, a, a computer engineer or a computer scientist or an information technologist, is most people, even the students who study computing, care about what computing will let them do rather than the technology per se. Yes, you have to know the core technology, but it's really those broader implications, the ability to actually do some good in the world that attracts students to computing in general. And as we think about that interplay, we have to think about how we broaden the curriculum to connect to those issues because those societal issues really matter.